Uh, I'm going to introduce Natalie Bebo, who's the filmmaker, who's actually a first time filmmaker, but you've got you know, a lot of experience in the film world, right? Um, yeah. Who's uh, based in Montreal. And uh, sh so she's the director of, of Boris and the Whistleblower. Hi, Natalie. Hi. Thanks for being with us. Um, and, uh, and then Phil Demers, who if you j did just watch the film, which I believe pretty much all of you did, is the, well, as, as your uh, Zoom tag says, you're the film subject slash hero of the walrus and the whistleblower so uh thanks for being with us phil um and uh we really appreciate you both making the time to talk to us tonight thanks for having us um obviously the first question uh i'm gonna ask is probably what anybody asks after they see the film which is what's the latest with smooshy i think i've been trying to keep up with you phil and see and uh seeing some stuff about what's going on with her what, what do you know about where you know her status right now well, <clears throat> everything that I say is pure speculation because I can't say that anything that I, I say is absolutely certain, but I think much of it is. Um, I understand that uh, uh, Marineland has affiliated uh, or made a business um, deal with a facility in Germany uh, where which they, they were intent on shipping Smooshi, who unbeknownst to us was, uh, was impregnated and was meant to uh, deliver a calf in Germany, but that I understand it. Uh, they had delayed the shipping, and uh, consequently, uh, COVID has kept Smooshy and what would be her newborn calf, which was announced uh, all of days after the premiere of the film here in Canada. Um, and so the last we'd known since June 3rd is that she is still in, in at Marineland uh, with calf, and those are both assumptions if she's still alive. Wow. Okay. Uh, has she given birth before? No, uh, which is which gives rise to a lot of suspicion as to how she became pregnant. Because with all the walruses that had died, it doesn't take much math to realize that a an, an animal that is habitually impregnated much earlier in their in their years doesn't become uh, pregnant uh, with the lone surviving male in the last days of its life before becoming impregnated. Uh, the German facility that, sh that Marineland is affiliated with, I, that I believe that they're affiliated with, uh, is also, uh, they specialize in walrus breeding, it should be noted. So I think there's, I think, I think, I think her impregnation was planned. How old is Smooshy? Um, and uh, what's the lifespan of a walrus? We'll call her 18. Uh, we'll call it 30, 35 at best. The lifespan at Marineland, she's already, she's already exceeded it. Uh, and, and, and quite a bit at this point. Yeah, and, and that's in the wild. I mean, in captivity, uh, yeah. a walrus past 20 years old is pretty unusual. Wow, okay. So she's not, she, I'm gonna guess, she's not necessarily in her prime child rearing years anymore. Is that true? No, no, no. And first time walrus uh, mothers, it's always a challenge. And in captivity, it's especially a challenge. In fact, uh, anytime that a walrus is born in captivity, it's, it's a cause for the industry to celebrate because it's such a rare event uh, for Marineland to pull that off, uh, despite having, you know, up at some point between six and nine walruses rampantly doing whatever. And yet they couldn't, I mean, there was never any risk of breeding. We never even gave it a second thought to Smooshy suddenly becoming pregnant at, uh, at 16 or 17 years of age with a team of German veterinarians who happened to be special specialists at uh, breeding animals is uh, it raises some concern have, I'm, I'm assuming the answer is yes but have you made any kind of an effort at, do you do you, to contact anybody in germany who can help you get some information yes i go uh, hard in all of that that's how i know that she's not been <laughs> right. shipped that's how i know that she's not been shipped mm -hmm. there's not been any uh, exports of late there's not any uh, animals being moved uh, so she's if again if she's still alive she's at marineland Mm -hmm. right. What's concerning is that there's been total silence since uh, they announced that she had the baby in June. And, um, you know, the first walrus birth in Canada was in 2016 when there were two born at the Quebec Aquarium. And it was caused, as Phil was saying, hu for huge celebration because it was the first time in history that it had, um, they had what they call successful live births in Canada. So this is a very unusual event in walrus captivity. And now there was the announcement in June, four days after the film first went to air here. And now there's absolute silence. 
So, Natalie, why don't you tell us, if you don't mind, uh, the connection between you and Phil? You guys, it, it, you know, it's on the Walrus, it, uh, uh, on the film's uh, website, you know, you describe how you've known each other personally for years, way before you started working on the film or way before Phil, just, you know, got, began working at Marineland. You want to just talk a little bit about that connection and uh, whether, I'm, I'm assuming maybe you didn't, you know, you didn't necessarily weren't in touch for many years until you started seeing Natalie, you started seeing, oh, that's my friend Phil from, from childhood, <laughs> who's now in the news because of this story at Marineland, right? So you want to talk a little bit about your, your friendship? Mm -hmm, sure. Uh, Phil was, uh, uh, I'd say, sort of a, an in and out personality, let's say, in my childhood. He would hang out with my brother a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Him and my brother were usually up to no good. And uh, I was a few years older, so we were in different social groups. Um, also and, up to no good uh, of note. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I, I will concede. I will concede. Of a, of a different kind, you know. Yeah. Sure, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I left that small town where we grew up when I was 17 and uh, lived around the world, uh, eventually landed in Toronto and then I moved to Montreal and so Phil and I weren't in touch at all. But what's really funny and it's not actually a story I've told very often mm -hmm. in all these interviews that we've been doing is that um, I started working in, in film by getting a job at uh, the CBC which is our public broadcaster here. Yeah. And I was working on a film about marketing to children. And we were doing a documentary where we wanted to film children interacting with brands to get a sense of how companies are trying to target young children and selling more product. And we were looking for a location to do this. And being from Niagara, I thought, hey, we could shoot at Marineland. And this is prior to, oh. you know, Phil becoming a whistleblower or any of this oh. happening. I had no idea what Phil was up to at this point. And so I called up Marineland and I said, hey, I'm a former Wellander from the region looking for a place to uh, film children having fun on roller coasters. And they said, sure, come on down. So I, I went with the camera crew and we started filming around. And all of a sudden, Phil comes up to me in a wetsuit. He's like, hey, Nat Bebo. And I was like, what? <laughs> what are you doing here? So we chatted for a second. He's like, oh, I got to go. I got the animals waiting for me. I was like, OK, see ya. It was quite strange. <laughs> and so it was shortly thereafter that he becomes this huge sensation right. in the media for his relationship with Smooshy. In fact, it was right after that. And right. Jimmy Kimmel is talking about him. All this stuff is going on. And I think to myself, this would make a cool film. But I don't, at that <laughs> point, there's no real story, right? It's just a guy and it's a bit of a fluff piece and it's sort of cute. But there's no real legs on it. It's just a, it's just a little blip. So years go by. And in 2012, I hear him again in the media, except this time, right, he's coming out with all these allegations. Mm. At this point, I haven't had any real contact with him in 20 years. Mm. And, um, and so then I really start thinking again, okay, I, I really should look at this closely. But it takes me years to build up the courage and really decide to, to approach him to do this. And there are a lot of reasons for that, which I can talk about. But um, it was so uh, strange to call him for the first time. I don't know if you remember, Phil, but just sort of, I think it was a, a Facebook message, wasn't it? Yeah, I remember it, yeah. I, yeah, and I sent him, I was like, so is there a documentary that's being made about this? And he said, well, lots of documentaries have been tried. Hmm. Uh, none have actually come to fruition for various reasons. And so that's how we first started to talk. And again, it took me a good year to come back and actually have a serious proposal and then pitch it and, and get the film made. But so we went many, many years without having any contact. We had that little blip meeting at Marineland, ironically. And then all of a sudden we find ourselves several years later, uh, quite closely connected and in, in discussing all these issues in a really serious way and, and got into production. When you first started talking about making the film together, uh, did it, you know, almost entirely help that you were all, you know, sort of, you know, neighborhood friends from back in Welland? Or was there an issue, was it, or was it sort of like, this is going to be weird, right? Because we're now we have a totally different working relationship that's completely different from just knowing each other from, you know, growing up and going to the same schools and all that. 100%. It was both. And I, you know, Phil's got some great insights into this too, but uh, I, I think it, it was one of the reasons it took me a long time to actually get up mm. off my chair to really 
make this thing because I wasn't sure I had never done a story about somebody I knew before mm -hmm. or about a region I knew before or about a park also that I had been to as a kid and had happy memories of so all of this was really like going home for me a place that in a lot of ways I tried hard to escape so mm -hmm. you know it, it's a small town limited options I took off um, and then all these years later, I find myself getting my first feature film license about a guy I knew as a kid and about, uh, you know, like this huge captivity story that was going on right near where I grew up. So I had a ton of trepidation um, and uh, Phil did too. I mean, if I, I would just say that whereas there was apprehension initially in that, you know, you want to keep, I guess, in the world of, of super professionalism, you, and then especially in the way that I would have imagined the, the doc's approach to be, I thought maybe best to not have someone to, you would know. But, you know, it, it became evident very quickly. I mean, it, look, everyone in Welland or anyone in the Niagara region knows Natalie Bibot as the, I don't want to say like overachiever, but always in the winning circle. So, and I wouldn't mind. I didn't mind giving her a little bit of a hard time with it all, to be fair, because I don't remember being in many winning circles, especially in, the, in high school and whatnot. But uh, you know, what yeah, we did have is what work. we did have is commonality in our language. And there's with me because I rant so much because I've got a temper that she's would be all too familiar with with all of Welland. You know, we're we have all, all of that. Now, Phil, so you know. <laughs> I just don't know that anyone else would have been able to understand me and have the same level of patience with me, whereas everyone else would have probably mm -hmm. faded long ago, mm -hmm. possibly reduced to ash. <laughs> <laughs> so I should point out that um, at, after I asked that question of Natalie, I noticed that one of our viewers had already posted essentially the same question. So thank you, Ryan O'Toole, for uh, posing that question. Um, Speaking of the winner's circle, Phil, I want you to, if you don't mind, tell me, tell, tell the viewers what you just told me about your connection to Boston. Oh, yeah, of course. I grew up with uh, Danny Paye. He grew up about nine, ten doors down, and we played uh, hockey as children. I remember when he won, uh, when he won Canada uh, uh, silver, when he played for the international uh, junior team. He was actually captain of Sidney Crosby's. Sidney Crosby's oh, wow. on the team. Yeah. He was captain, and... The following day, they played. They played in East Canada, East Coast Canada, and the following day, we're out playing street hockey and everything else. And we see this this tall kid walking down the street with his hockey stick, and you know, who's this kid? And and you know, it's Danny coming down. It was just, it's, I don't know, it's just such a wonderful story. But yeah, I do have uh, a connection to Boston because I was able to actually see Dan play multiple times in Boston, and I uh, got to party with him down home and, and hoist the cup in celebration with his right. big victory. So for those of you who are not hockey fans, Danny Pye was on the 2012 Stanley Cup winning Bruins team. And Phil was here to hoist the cup. He was at one of the part, one of the many parties, I think, that the hockey players throw when they have the cup to celebrate, right? Yeah, it's good times to be had. <laughs> and then another thing that we talked about before we went live here, Phil, that I would like you to address back to the film. Um, you Tell us where you live in Niagara. Um, and tell us what you can see out your window. Right, so at Marineland's tallest landmark uh, 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 amusement ride is called Skyscreamer. And if their light was on right now, I could actually tilt this camera and you'd be able to see it in the distance, faint albeit. But, you know, um, if I open my window, you can actually hear the rumble of Niagara Falls in the distance. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the proximity from me to Marineland is, is, is so close that in the winter, in the dead of winter, when there's no foliage, uh, there's no trees, nothing, like the, all the leaves are down. There's a clear path between my, with my property and essentially uh, one of the whale pools. And back in the day, when we had multiple whales, they would have them sing, and I could actually hear them mm -hmm. uh, making that sound, forcing the air through their blowhole from my, my balcony in the in this, in this crispest of winter days. It's crazy. But yeah, I'm very close. Very, I, can, I can sense them. So in the ongoing fight against marine land and their treatment of the animals, um, what does it mean to you to live basically in the shadow of the place? Like, so do you look out the window sometimes and you're just, uh, it's got to be frustrating, but on the other hand, it's probably also inspirational to sort of feel like, well, you know, one day maybe the lights will go off for good and I'll be able to see that. Is that, I mean, is it's it not, a mixed bag? It's probably a mixed bag if they ever were off my mind, but I've just had this like steadfast focus of just being in this, mission that being close to them just means I'm able to
be closer to them to, to, to watch what's going on. And that's mm -hmm. how I've managed to keep my thumb on the pulse and sort of keep, keep people abreast of all the things that are happening. Because I mean, often enough, I'm letting people know what's happening because I'm finding out first. Yeah. You know, I'm there. Right. I'm there. Where do things stand litigation wise? Um, so oddly enough, this is the one year anniversary of when we got to examine Marineland and through uh, in litigation, you have a series of different steps, but one is called discovery yeah. <clears throat> where you uh, you're supposed to willingly provide the evidence that you're bringing forth to, to support your allegations against someone. And you show it to the, to the other person that they can are able to look, have a look at it so that they can properly defend. That was one year ago. Uh, and we won that by way of court order because Marineland kept delaying, delaying, delaying. And, uh, we had a September, if I'm not mistaken, September 10th court date where which we were going to compel them to, uh, to, to, to provide the evidence once again. Uh, they signed an order which puts them on essentially a clock. It's a court order. Uh, this thing ends before, I mean, I say this, I've said it before, but by, by virtue of court order, I don't know what happens if they capitulate. I don't know what the, how long the process continues but I understand that there's some pretty nasty ramifications if they continue. Uh, but my understanding is this thing gets strong consideration to be finished before 2021. Wow. Yeah, there's a series of dates, one of which is December 18th, where I'm pretty sure the merits of the lawsuit have to be discussed amongst parties. But I, I might be talking about something I'm not supposed to. I don't know. So if Marineland's lawyer is watching this, and he is, you can bring it up. But I didn't know. I didn't know. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, so uh, I have a question from Kathy Downey um, for uh, Natalie. Um, and Kathy is, um, uh, has been a, a great friend to the Newburyport Doc Fest for many years now. She is a tireless uh, animal rights advocate. So anytime we have any film about animals, uh, Kathy helps us promote and helps us spread the word. And uh, she has a very specific question for you, Natalie, and I'm going to just read it because if I try to paraphrase it, I'm not going to do her justice. So she's, she writes, um, the sentience of non-human animals is an undercurrent in your film. What remark does your film make on human nature? Wow, can you repeat that? The sentence yeah, of not human animals? Yeah, so she's saying, you know, that obviously that we get to see that Smooshy, you know, is acting essentially like a dog, and we think of our dogs as having personalities, right? Um, and so she, she's talking about the idea that, you know, animals feel, right? And um, so she's wondering if, if that's so, and if your film makes that clear um, with regard to Smooshy and all the other animals at Marine Land, um, making that case that animals do feel and do have emotions and do make connections. What does that say about human beings? And what does that say about human nature? Well, it says, I mean, it could say a lot of nasty things about human nature. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I think that's what she's implying, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But I think um, it's not a black and white answer because mm -hmm. I think uh, as I tried to show in the film, we're all on a spectrum when it comes to our relationship with animals and our uh, our desire to see them as sentient beings and what it is we do with that information, even when we come to know it, right? And so uh, I think that our desire to marvel at and gaze at what is foreign, whether it's a non-human animal or mm -hmm. whether it is a, a person with a disability, the way we used to cage them up in the right. 19th century or mm -hmm. people of other cultures, which we, we used to do as well, right? Mm -hmm. To anything that is foreign that is outside of us um, we have had this somewhat twisted desire to gaze at marvel at and own right we want to own these things that we love and we've done this with all kinds of creatures humans included and now we've been doing it with marine mammals um, and, and I think that we, we, our human nature is as vast as, as anything else. You know, we, ha we have this ability to be horribly cruel, but we also have this ability to be incredibly self-sacrificing and magnanimous um, mm -hmm. and, and gracious. And also we have the ability to evolve. And I think that is one of the key themes in the film is this idea of transformation. Because, you know, there, there, there was a day when Phil, even though he describes now having an intuitive discomfort with with having the animals in captivity he also talks about how amazing it was to be close to such creatures yeah, sure and 
for me, one of the, the, and perhaps Kathy has picked up on this, and she probably has, but one of the greatest ironies of Phil's story is that the only way he learned to believe that captivity was wrong was through the closeness captivity offered him. Mm -hmm. So the ability to get close to, to this animal is actually what then led him to uh, believe that they shouldn't be incarcerated or they, they, you know, that they had emotions, their emotional capabilities were strong enough that they deserved more. And, and so I think that that um, spectrum and that transformation is a journey that we're all on. And if I want to end that, you know, the answer to that question on a, on a positive note, I'd say mm -hmm. that we have this tremendous ability to adapt and evolve and change. And so I think that the, whether you're talking about the industry itself or you're talking about customers to the captivity industry, if we really start to look at it with our eyes open, um, we'll, we'll see quite quickly that something needs to, to change. And mm -hmm. as humans, we're capable of doing that. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, this seems like a question for Natalie, although I think either one of you can answer it. This is from a, a viewer named Julia Mallon. Julia asks, um, why you chose a film or documentary as your platform for activism. Um, and I, I, I'm assuming that she means, she didn't say, but I'm assuming that that should be addressed to Natalie. I don't even know, Natalie, were you necessarily assuming that your first film feature would be some kind, uh, some form of activism, or is it just about the story, Phil's mm -hmm. story? That is the million dollar question. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. I you know, I don't uh, see myself as an activist per se. I see myself more as a storyteller. Yeah. And however, um, I, you know, one of the things that you have to do when you're a filmmaker, certainly the kind of training that I had is you have to come at everything with an open mind. And so, you know, whether I'm approaching the, the owner of a, of a marine park or I'm talking to a, a murderer um, who's been incarcerated for 20 years for killing his wife, whatever it is, um, I have to come at that with a, a clean, open mind and willing mm -hmm. to receive any new information. So I don't consider myself to be an activist out with a particular agenda. I see myself as um, someone who wants to do what's right. And I, th I think there's um, a difference. Um, and I also think that there's a, a benefit to continuing to see things with an open mind, even though I certainly have an own, my own personal opinion from having done a lot of research and having spoken to a lot of people on all sides of the issue, I have a, a, an opinion on this issue. But um, this idea of staying open means that I can actually tell a better story because you know, I'm able to tell a story about Phil that's a little more nuanced than a classic, let's say, activist film that perhaps wouldn't have included a scene uh, with a guy eating a steak. You know, the, uh, you know, if I was a clear activist, I would never, ever have done that. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to portray more nuance and, and a, um, I hope anyway, a more fulfilling portrait of this struggle because I wasn't coming at it from a really narrow point of view. And yet as a whole, the film certainly has a thesis. It has a, you know, so I think that's, that's where I'm coming from anyway. All right. Um, so let me see, let me check the uh, audience questions again. Um, so uh, let's see, Deborah from Townsend Mass wants to know, are you either of you, uh, Phil, I guess this is probably more of a question for you. Are you taking your activism to the US? And if so, with what result? I know you're focused on Smooshy and Marine Land, but to what extent does your activism uh, spread to all of the marine parks around the US or, or, or internationally? I mean, I've actually done and worked with more on a consulting like basis, but uh, uh, on a bill in California that's meant to stop all um, uh, captive animal performances. Uh, it's a little ambitious, but in, like it has some retiring issues in it and whatnot. But um, mm -hmm. I would say the extent of my activism is such in the States that because I am often on the Joe Rogan podcast or because mm -hmm. more often the podcasts that I go on are more popular in the States, m much of my story resonates with them. And so the industry as a whole is, is sort of like... Um, I'm guessing uh, suffering a little bit on account. I mean, Blackfish did its thing uh, years ago and that wave still is taking care of the states and especially when it comes to legislation and whatnot. I mean, the, the, the climate right now in the states politically is not such that you're gonna get a lot of work done 
uh, for animals benefits. I don't imagine. You think right we now, have other things to, to deal with? Right? Yeah, I just, I just don't. I just, you guys can, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so, I mean, my hope as always is that people realize there's just a vote with your dollar. So just don't give these places your money. Don't yeah. do it. So I'm glad you mentioned Blackfish because that was another thing I wanted to ask. I mean, clearly when you make a film like this, Natalie, right, you get, you, you, you ha I mean, obviously, you know, of what's come before, you, you know, activism in general um, has been defined in large part, I think, over the last 20 years or so by all the various big films, like, you know, whether you're talking about climate change, Inconvenient Truth, Al Gore's film kind of set the template for how people talk about climate change. And that came out 15 years ago or whatever it is now. And clearly Blackfish and maybe The Cove, you know, there's been other, uh, you know, animal rights films that kind of set the template for, for and, and it, in a powerful way for the story you're telling. So to what extent did you let yourself be influenced by them? And to what extent did you just say, I'm telling this story, you know, yeah, it's about uh, mistreatment of animals similar to their story, but this is a, this is my story and this is a different, this is Phil's story. This is a different story. Mm. I think I definitely focused a lot on what I was doing in this particular case because um, uh, I, I had, you know, studied Blackfish. I spoke to a lot of the people who were involved with Blackfish. A lot of them helped me actually by giving me material and introducing me to people in the making of this film. Uh, Jeff Ventry, who's a wonderful guy, who's uh, was really helpful to me actually in the production of this film, who's one of the stars of Blackfish, one of the ex-trainers. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in the Cove, of course, uh, Rick O'Berry's people helped me out a fair bit. I spoke to Rick mm -hmm. personally too. Mm -hmm. Rick has has been a great supporter of Phil's throughout the years. So there's a lot of connections, mm -hmm. but because, so I think particularly because of the popularity of those films and the impact they had, I very early on decided that I would make um, a film that was a, uh, in the same sphere, but different and unique unto itself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the um, wonderful gifts I had in a, in a character like Phil, because he isn't a classic activist. He's not, um, a, a guy who's on a really straight, predictable path. And the mission is nuanced and it's, you know, the whole story has, a, there's a lot of human humanity in this story, I think. I hope people are picking up on the fact that this is a film about our relationship to animals and like non-human animals and human animals. It's about our relationship to ourselves, how mm -hmm. we deal with conflict, the hills we're willing to die on, mm -hmm. uh, to what extent uh, the hubris exists in the industry of people who are, who, who've survived films like Blackfish and The Cove, but are still willing to fight to the death to keep whales in captivity, mm. right? And there's a certain kind of, of corruption there and, and questions of corporate accountability. And on the flip side, you've got a guy like Phil who really identified as a trainer, loved his job, left it for, to, you know, to obey his conscience. But I feel like the, the human story that I have there is not something that's addressed in, in Blackfish in the Cove. So I went in a slightly different direction while still remaining in the same theme. Uh, because who, you know, you don't want to try to read, you don't want to try to reinvent the wheel, right? Like no one's ever going to make Blackfish again. Blackfish was made. It had a, its moment in history and it'll continue to have its life. I wanted to have my own mark on the, on the um, issue. Right. So, uh, Phil, that kind of leads directly into my next question. I think something that Natalie just said, I'm just curious if you, I, know, I mean, obviously the film shows some of this, but I'm wondering if you can just kind of put into words what it was like when you were still training at Marine Land, when you really first started realize, having that, coming to that realization that you were bonding so profoundly with this walrus. That was, uh, I mean, that's, we're talking a lot of years ago, but that was yeah. really exciting. I mean, suddenly <clears throat> your job goes from being arguably one of the most unique ever to definitely, definitely the most unique ever. <laughs> because I was suddenly showing up to work and, you know, whereas before I'd show up five minutes late, now I'm 15 minutes early because if I go early, I can let the, you know, at the time, Smooth, she was a baby. She was all of 200 pounds. I could, I could flip the gate open, let her out. And while I'm rinsing all the other animals' yeah. poop back into the water and, the, you know, I'm cleaning the bars and stuff, she's beside me like a puppy dog, absolutely just, just wanting to be beside me. I mean, oh. it, was the crazy, it was the craziest thing we'd ever seen. So, and it was new because the industry as a whole never seen. I mean, suddenly we had people from SeaWorld coming down and now they're taking a look. We've got a professor over at Canisius College. He wants to take a look, like, what is this? And that's how they determined that, uh, that uh, I had imprinted on her and that this was, uh, you know, very unique. Uh, right. So it was awesome. 
Yeah. So what, you know, I'm, I would imagine some kind of switch flipped for you at that point, right? Like, oh my God, I mean so much to this other living creature. Yes. So that's where uh, you suddenly, whereas animals becoming sick was always, a, you know, it's, a, it's the difficult part of the job. The animals sure. dying is the worst. Uh, but never in your mind do you, you never have that level of connection like I've had suddenly with Smooshy. So suddenly when this thing became, <clears throat> you know, amidst it being awesome and everything else, suddenly things start to get a little weird. She starts to get unhealthy mm -hmm. or, you know, and there was many incidents of health scares that, you know, my, I went, I went crazy. I went nuts. I mean, the veterinarians had, they, they, they almost had to sedate me just to, just to, get me out of the room sometimes. Suddenly I understand why my mother's freaking out when I had my teeth knocked out uh, with a hockey stick. Like I get it now. So yeah, I had a profound change. It's funny because, you know, some people walk away from the film and they'll say, uh, you know, Phil's got this big ego and Phil's got this big, that big, this, and, and that's fair. You're looking from a distance. You're, you're watching it through, through your own lens. But I defend that in that, I'm a walrus mom going freaking crazy. You can interpret that as you wish, but know what it is. It's like, uh, even I'm, even I can't, uh, I, I, even I can't explain or understand what it is. And that will tell you where I'm faced with a brick wall. And she's just like, well, what are you going to do? And I do the, uh, the polar opposite of what she would do. And she buckles her seatbelt. She just says like, you're brave dude. <laughs> and I'm just like, I don't even know where it comes from. I just don't. Mm hmm. It's funny, Kurt, Nat once said, you know, Phil, I, I, I know I, I've pr I pride myself on how courageous I am, but dude, like, you know, and I thought, I, I thought that meant, that meant something to me, man. I was just like, what? I'm brave. What? Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a recklessness that you have, Phil, like there's a, and, and I hope you take that kind of as a compliment, but it's, no, it's not really anymore. Not anymore. I'm, I want to retire it. I want to retire getting old? that. You're getting old, right? You're getting yeah, old. I want to retire it. I'm ready to retire that. I yeah. spoke of this recently. I think I got. A, I think I one time hit my head too hard as a child, and I think I, I became like reckless a little bit. Yeah, yeah but, but, but everyone in Welland somehow did. There's <laughs> definitely a scorched earth thing that you have, Phil. That but, like, I know. I know. Like, yes. What? what? Well, I was just saying, moms of children don't outgrow the idea that they would run through the brick wall for their grown children if they need to, right? I'm still plowing my head through that wall. I mean, I, I've still got a steadfast focus. That ain't going to change, but I need to address my life more like a person who needs to exercise more uh, uh, calculated restraint <laughs> rather than uh, uh, just at every given moment wanting everything to be... Uh, immediately corrected mm -hmm. right uh we have a question from our viewer javon hi javon um uh who wants to know if there's anything that us non any of us uh, non-canadians can do specifically to help the cause of saving smooshy well for me it always comes down to um uh, my lifeline in court and that just comes down to money so i, I always <laughs> I always direct people over to my fundraiser which is safe smooshy.com but in the larger picture, if you want to help uh, uh, the industry as a whole, the animals as a whole, then I, I, I mean, my advice is friends don't let friends go to Marineland. Uh, same thing is for your Sea Worlds, and uh, I mean, I'll extend it even to 99% of your zoos. Do your homework, see where the money goes. You want to see where how much money gets uh, allocated to cons conservation versus how much goes to profits. Uh, but re the reality is, if you want if you want to create change and you want to have an effect, then uh, then, then starve these places. Don't give them your money and make sure your friends don't go either. You could also write to Marine Land and tell them what you think about Smooshy or Phil or what, you know? Each yeah. one, teach one. Yeah. Uh, you know, what you just said about, you know, not spending your money at these places made me think that I hadn't thought of this before, but obviously this, some, I'm sure this was true in Canada because it certainly was true in the U.S. It's kind of at the beginning of COVID times, it seemed like every single human being was watching Tiger King, right? Did you guys mm -hmm. watch it? Mm -hmm. I did. I loved it. <laughs> I, went, I went crazy. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, what, you know, uh, that 
talk about, uh, you know, multiple layers of issues, right? I mean, um, it was a compelling soap opera, but it was also obviously about the well-being of the tigers or the lack of well-being of the tigers. Mm-hmm. What, you know, and uh, that seems like a million years ago already because it was at it the does. beginning of COVID times. But, um, but what is, and, and this kind of maybe goes back to Kathy Downey's question for Natalie about what does it say about the way we treat animals that, about the people, right? So, um what what do you think what do you think that was all about that everybody was so i mean is it is it too facile to to suggest that because we were all sort of feeling locked down that we were all fascinated by this idea of captivity mm-hmm. no i think it could have something absolutely something to do with it um you know it's i think i think phil had a tweet recently correct me if i'm wrong phil but i think he said something like you know if you know if you're feeling like garbage being locked up yeah, in your yeah, home yeah. imagine to be one of those right to be locked mm-hmm. up for the rest of your life so i think there's something to that for sure but i think one of the things about tiger king is that it strikes at the heart of of you know how i was answering kathy's question is that you know even though we we know we should treat animals in a certain way we can't help ourselves but be close to them and want to touch them. Like I, I saw a, a really staunch animal rights activist and a, and a vegan say online, can't help but watch Tiger King. And yes, it's all horribly wrong, but who doesn't want to hold a baby tiger? Mm-hmm. And it was that exact, I think that's really at the heart of it is, you know, we, we want to own, we want to have what it is we yeah. love. And it's very difficult for for us humans to divorce ourselves from that and say, no, it's, it's in, what's in your best interest is for me to leave you that alone, right? It's for me just to walk away, let you be independent and not to touch you and not to interfere with you. But what I feel like doing is coming over and petting you, right? And so there's a real, there's a push and pull there, which I think Tiger King very elegantly, elegantly danced around. And it had like crazy characters that epitomize this. Right. Do, do you know what that is? Everyone wants the relationship I have with Smooshy. Mm-hmm. That's it. Everyone wants for the, for, to have this connection with an animal where suddenly it goes from being wild and a disconnected thing that you don't understand to, to you being its favorite thing. How can it be? I had that. That happened. That's that because I, we're all trying to I, fill I a void. Yeah. And we're all trying to fill a void of some kind, right? Some longing. Um, we want to be loved unconditionally. And uh, some of us can only find it in animals, right? And I think the Joes of the world, perhaps that, that might be the case. And yeah, and you talk about the your relationship with Smooshy, how it was unlike any other relationship you've ever had, hmm. right? I haven't They're... smashed my head against walls for ex-girlfriends. <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, but yeah, right. Um, so every, everybody who's asked about, or everybody who I've mentioned this film to uh, since I first saw it a few months ago, um, I've, I've, I've basically described Smooshy as acting like a dog with you, like, like you're, you know, you're, and you've said it too, Phil, right? Especially when she was young, when she was a, a pup, right? Mm-hmm. Um, are either of you dog owners? I'm not. I've got cats. I've got too many. I, I can't keep up with them. I got neighbors' cats showing up and everything else. I mean, it's great. Um, I love cats, but I'm actually oddly, and I think people might find this odd, but I don't. I try to stay away from pets these days, especially dogs, because mm-hmm. I don't want to like them, and I mm-hmm. definitely don't want them to like me. It's the weirdest thing, but I try to just. I don't want to like dogs because then I'll have one or two and then I'll be sad again when they die and they die. Right. You know, they only live eight, 10 years, man. That's not enough for me. Like I got my, I got cats that are born in the nineties still. Like I like a good 20 years out of my, out of my relationships, but I I don't know. For me, it's just the notion of it all is a little too heartbreak. And I think I'd like to keep my distance from now on to, to pets. That sounds weird, but I don't know. It's sort of how I feel. That's a good point. But also cats are just cats and they're aloof. And so they, they do live a long, you know, a relatively long time comparative to, to most dogs, but they also are just cats. So they're, you know, they don't, they don't really care if you like them or not. And they're not really going to follow you around for the most part. Right. I mean, you know, if I don't feed them, uh, they'll eat me. So they, they keep me feeding them and, I don't know who's training who, but you know, we, it's a symbiotic relationship. It works. Um, Natalie, maybe you can tell, so I think you've, you've said, um, well, you, you, you talked about it earlier, I think, but you went, you grew up uh, probably like everybody in Welland, right? Like doing like sort of field trips or family trips to Marineland, right? 
Yep, absolutely. Yeah, one of my uh, one of the huge pictures that was on uh, our wall. I don't know if you remember it, Phil. When I was growing up, was a, a big blown up picture of my baby sister clapping hands in the stands at Marineland, and you know my dad's kind of in the background. He's holding her and the joy in her face, and she's so excited. And my parents had blown that up and they put it on the wall. And um, and I went. You know, they took me a fair bit, and then school trips were kind of you. Know, you know, you, you rarely got out of a school year without going to Marine Line at least yeah. once, I would say, when we were growing up. Um, so, yeah, it was it was pretty frequent that uh, that we went. Mm -hmm. Do you think they still do the school trips? Not as much as they did, uh, for sure. I think that's really changed, and I think Phil can definitely speak to that. Um, I don't mind saying, uh, Phil, that, uh, you know, when all this happened with Phil, I mean, you have to think, like, the story, the, the documentary that you guys have just watched, right, is this stranger-than-fiction tale that really, you, could, you can't write this stuff. And yet it all went down in this tiny little town. So you can imagine yeah. how amplified the effect was there. So if you're feeling anything right now after seeing, seeing the film, imagine what you would feel like if you were living this thing, like within mm -hmm. a few kilometers of where you grew up. And so there's a lot of people in Niagara for, for which this story was the talk of the town for a long time. And now with the documentary, it's all coming back. Um, and it, it was a, a, a big um, local to do when, you know, Phil came out and, and this stuff came out in the media, it went viral, it was international. And one of the things Marineland did was they wrote a letter to local teachers warning them that what Phil was saying and what Phil's girlfriend was saying and other employees were saying was not true and they shouldn't be listened to or they shouldn't be trusted. So they knew the impact it could have on school trips. They and tried to get ahead of right? it. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I, I was shocked to read that. Um, and, and, and I, I understand why they did it, but it just shows the, the impact that they knew it was going to have. And now, I mean, I, I can't speak because I, I don't, I don't live as close as Phil does, but I haven't seen a school bus out there in, in quite some time, but. No, I went so. on tour. I went on tour. I just went to every school. That was easy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, oh, you don't want me to go to schools. Okay. I can talk to schools. Okay. <laughs> I got to thank Marine Land's lawyer. He, he gave me the blueprint of how to defeat them. Don't go to schools. Oh, okay. Go to schools. <laughs> I mean, so much, much, of their, yeah. Yeah. much of their legal complaint is specifically has everything to do with schools. So I just go to more schools. Yeah. And, and as far as you know, Phil, they have probably lost a lot of that, you know, sort of trip business, right? Oh, you, you, are you not, you're not supposed to say that on, on No, campus? no, I'm happy to. There's, there's nothing I won't say. No, they're devastated. <laughs> they're crushed. Their attendance is, is, I mean, it's abysmal. I mean, uh, this year, I mean, of course, uh, circumstantially, but in years past, yeah, they're struggling. They're just, I mean, they're already selling off properties. They're trying to sell off whales. Unfortunately for them, we wrapped them in red tape. We turned those whales to being invaluable dollars and cents wise to being things they they're having a hard time uh, moving now. Wow. Uh, so they're going to have a hard time actually making any money off them. So uh, in every which way that they tried to preserve their business, they gave away the blueprint on how to destroy them. Wow. All right. Do you, how many, uh, do, do, you know, do you have any sense of how many animals they've had to sort of offload to other marine parks around the world um, out of necessity because of financial? So, as we speak, uh, they're working on trying to export five the at the uh, in the U.S. end. Uh, all the, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I just said belugas. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Beluga whales. So on the U.S. side, that's already been sort of uh, rubber stamped. Now, granted, uh, the, the animals that if successfully exported and if they if it passes with the new uh, Canadian legislation, um, uh, that, that I understand they can't breed them. They can't, the animals can't perform. They're, they're still protected under the new legislation and laws here. But yeah, Marine Land just can't unimpededly sell like they used to. They used to be able to just sell. And in fact, uh, we had, and I shook the hand of uh, an actual billionaire, uh, the, the founder of uh, Home Depot. And he was touring Marine Land years ago because he wanted to buy some beluga whales and he couldn't buy them. So Marine Land's owner was really, his plan was to sit on belugas, breed them rampantly and then sell them. Uh, to the industry when he knew and, and and he wasn't wrong because look what's happening in China and these these facilities are are ramping up like crazy so he would have had a he would have had a cornerstone in the entire market to sell these invaluable animals but we uh, we we took that from from Marineland we took that from them yeah they don't have that no more right 
So your audience actually might be uh, uh, interested in knowing actually that the belugas Phil's talking about are trying to be sold to an aquarium called Mystic Aquarium, which is oh, yeah. not far from you guys in Connecticut. Connecticut yeah. sure. And they went through the permitting process for quite a long time, I think over a year, uh, to get uh, NOAA, uh, your government agency, to agree to allow to bring these whales in, because there is protection for marine mammals in the US, not extensive as what was passed in Canada, which is uh, featured in the film, but there is some legislation that protects whales. And uh, anyway, they we just found out that they got their permit in the end. So on the American side, the deal is clear. It's now the Canadian government that has to decide whether or not marine Land's sale to Mystic Aquarium is valid and legal under our new very harsh and, and strict laws around captivity. So mm -hmm. it's it's very current if, if anyone's interested in learning more about it, um, because Mystic is not far from you guys. No, There's no. actually a legal challenge that's been uh, that's been uh, launched as well in in. Uh, uh, in that to, to stop the export as well so you know there's things there's a there's a war waging as we speak uh, and and in every which way affiliated to marine land so yeah right okay great well um that's a lot to digest and i really appreciate you both uh helping us do so um i think that the audience was uh pretty uh pretty thrilled to be involved and i'll just i'll just point out again to those of you who kind of got in uh, feeling like you, 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 you got into class a little late for whatever reason. I don't know if we were having technical troubles or what, but please do go back and watch the beginning of the conversation. Uh, you know, this will be available at any point now that you've watched the film and watched this part of the Q&A. You can go back and just stream the beginning if you want to. Um, really great to have you both here. Um, we look forward to uh, uh, continuing to see how things go, and we wish you all the best, Phil, in your fight. Um, and uh, Natalie, we're really looking forward to seeing what your next film is because this one was so well made, you know, not at all seeming like you're, you know, the first time filmmaker that you're billed as. Um, so we look forward to seeing whatever your next project is. Um, and uh, we'll keep an eye on you, Phil. The Walrus Whisperer, um, for those of you who don't know, and I don't know if we even mentioned it yet, um, all you got to do is uh, look them up on Twitter under that handle, right? And uh, you can have daily updates on uh, what's going on with Phil's fight. So um, thanks so much. <laughs> thanks so much to both of you for uh, joining us. And um, uh, I'm just going to uh, do a little sign off in a second, but you guys are free to go and, uh, uh, and carry on the fight. So thanks for being with us. Thanks Thank a lot. You very my much. pleasure. And thanks so much to the festival for, for showing this film. Uh, I regret that I wasn't able to meet you guys in person, but uh Hopefully that'll happen someday.